Evening, ladies and gents, my name is Simon Brown doing uh, this evening's boot camp session. This is number four in the in the series that we've been doing. So the boot camp sessions kicked off in July. They're running through to June of next year with various topics. The first ones we've done is getting started in trading. We looked at margin, leverage, and exposure in the second. And then the third, we looked at putting together a trading plan. Those, if you go to justonelap.com, the videos are all available there for you to view or download. Um, and this event this evening will be on the website as well within a couple of days as well, November, December, until we've done the whole series of, of 12 of them. Um, and this evening we're looking at, at, at global trading and we could put a slash there if we wanted and say trading or investing. Um, they're distinctly different. And I'll talk about those differences in a bit, but I'm, I'm going to kind of interchangeable them this evening. What we're basically looking at is taking our money and, and, and moving it into a different currency and trading or investing on different exchanges. We can kind of quasi do that at the moment. We do it via buying a Deutsche Bank X tracker, which kind of does the job. We do it by kind of buying SAB Miller. Um, or Richmond, one of the dual listed companies that have got a large amount of offshore exposure. But none of that's really the real deal. So what we're going to look at this evening really, really is that, that real deal. And we're going to go through a bunch of different stages and processes and some practical nitty gritty bits and some, some, some more sort of ethereal. If you've got questions, throw them at me. We've certainly got time uh, for questions. But what I want to start off with is this, and now we're stepping back from global trading. This is more just about trading. And this was a, a report I read, which absolutely fascinated me. It comes from dailyfx.com. And basically, it crunched a bunch of data from, from clients who were trading. In this case, they were trading FX. And what it discovered that the win-loss ratios were actually not bad. The winners were around 53%. The losers were around 47%. The problem is we were taking profits too quickly, and we were taking losses too slowly. In other words, we, we, instead of taking a five rand loss, we let it turn into a 10 rand loss. And instead of, you know, then we get to profit and we take a two rand profit. And there's a couple of reasons, and I want to spend a minute or two on, on, on why we do this and how we can try and manage it. And the reason is quite simple. <clears throat> it's loss aversion. The pain of a, a, a uh, uh, <clears throat> if, you could measure, if you could measure feeling on a scale of one to 10, pain in a 10 rand loss is equal to the, 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 the jubilation of a five rand gain. In other words, Losing is, costs us twice what gaining, what, what winning actually gains us. So a couple of things happen. We, we, we rush off and we, we, we hate the idea of losing money. We take a couple of points from it. Firstly, our position is too big. In other words, our trade size is too big. So when our stop loss gets hit, the RAND value we're going to lose is simply too painful, so we don't take it. We ignore our stop loss. Of course, we know what happens. It gets worse and worse and worse. But that first time when we've now got to action the stop loss, we simply don't. We're too scared to. Um, we, we don't take the stop loss because we're scared of being wrong. And I've spoken in the, in the previous sessions about how we measure success in trading. It's not about profit in an individual trade. It's about the discipline to the system. But we simply let our losses get too big. We overtrade. We don't obey the stop losses. We decide that the market is wrong and it will turn and come back and everything will be okay. Um, and that never is the case, ever. Not even like occasion. You just it never comes back and everything is okay. Um, and so we we extend our potential losses. And mostly it's all our fault. And then on the gain side, what happens as soon as we get into a slight profit position, we're so excited and so thrilled by it and so want to be able to tell our friends about it that we quickly close the position so we can take that profit. And most traders, <clears throat> excuse me, the vast majority of traders, 90% or more. We take profits too quickly. We take profits too quickly for a couple of reasons. One, we, we want that adjubilation. We want that rush of, I made a profit. Two, we're scared of profit turning into a loss. And we're terrified that our little profit or our decent-sized profit suddenly turns against us. More importantly, we lack ambition. And what I mean by we lack ambition, as a species, we don't lack ambition. As a species, we're very ambitious. We, we, we build pyramids and other such amazing things. We're massively ambitious. What I mean by we lack ambition is that if you had bought Capitec at 20 rand a share in 2008, what did you do at 25 rand? You sold it because it had gone up 25%, except now it's at 560. We forget that trends actually play out over extended periods of time. 
and even within the stock market, trends are not running for hours or days or weeks. Trends are running for years. Capitech has been in an uptrend now for 12 years. Aspen was in an uptrend for 16 years. SAB has been in an uptrend for 10 years. And there's been blips along the way. Now, 2008 was undoubtedly a blip. But we get over-concerned by those blips. And we get worried about what might happen. So what I want folks to do is to go and look at your trading, see if you're falling into this, and see why are your losses too big and what can you do about it. Is it just discipline? Is it just process? Is there somewhere that you can be reduce them? And what I don't mean is that if your stop loss is typically X wide, you go make it half X. An X stop loss is fine. The point is execute at that point. And don't make your stop loss 10% and your profit 5%. Of course, make your profits bigger. But then focus on the profit side. To me, the hardest part of trading is taking a profit. Taking a loss is easy. I get to a certain point, stop loss hit, get out of the trade, move on to the next one. It's the easiest thing in the world. The hardest part is taking that profit because you simply don't know where it's going to go. If you had bought Capitech at 20 rand, and you had told your friends the plan was to sell it at 560 Rand eight years later. Yeah, they would have laughed, they would have laughed at you. Justifiably so. Except, well, that's what you could have done. And do you sell Capitech at 560? It'd be crazy the thing's going up. You know, sell it at a thousand. Probably not even then. So what we need to interrogate is 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 where we exit. What I do to to try and solve the problem, because I exited too early on everything. I mean, there wasn't a, a you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about leaving cents on the table. I'm, what I do is I don't exit at targets. I don't have something run and decide I will get out at this point. I only exit at stop loss. Which sounds counterintuitive because then a lot of your winners actually end up being losers. But what happens is occasionally, not often, but occasionally your winners become massive. You just find yourself on that right bus at the right time. Uh, a couple of recent examples, Calgra M3. Yeah, I didn't buy it 50 cents. I bought it three rand or four rand, and now I don't know, it's, it's 20 odd or something like that. Um, and I got an exit strategy. We've just never come anywhere close to it. I, I did a trade on the Indy that, that I rode out for 34 months in one trade. Um, and it, it gave me about 130% ungeared. The point was is that it was just running. And because it was so strong, it never came back to my stop loss. Now, those are infrequent, but they more than make up for the occasional 5% profit you had that suddenly became a 2% loss. That's fine. I just think as predicting targets, as human beings, we're fairly bad at it because, as I said earlier, we lack ambition. So interrogate where you're exiting, downside and upside, and see if you can't pull the downside up and push the upside up as well. And even if you just do that by one or two percentage points on either side, that's a massive swing in your trading. And I'm going to delve into it in a lot more detail in one of the, the latest sessions. So I'll park it there for now. Let's get on to, to global stuff. Uh, I check my phone purely because I need to see what the time is because there's no other clocks around or something like that. So I'm going to come to some practicals. I want to kick off initially with exchange traded funds, ETFs. Quickly for folks who are not sure what we're talking about in the ETF space. Exchange traded fund is, is, is pretty much like a, a unit trust. In other words, it is a basket of shares. And we buy that basket. And we then get exposure to it. The difference is a unit trust has got people who are trying to buy the best shares in the world. And the ones that are going to perform best so that they can give you great profit and return. In truth, after costs, only 15% of them manage to beat the market. The exchange traded fund says nonsense. Let's just define our benchmark and index. And we buy all the stocks. We put them in a basket and we sell you the basket. You could go and buy the individual shares yourself, but you're going to get slaughtered by transaction fees. So it, it's, it's basically saying is to that underlying index, whatever it might be, commodity, we will match the return that it gives. So if you've bought uh, an ETF on the S&P 500, which is the index in the US of the 500 largest shares, and that goes up 20%, your ETF goes up 20%. And if the index goes down 10, your ETF goes down 10. And over the long term, indices go up. So the down days don't stress us and we let them ride. Typically they are investing products. What we certainly can do, and I do it with my lazy system, excuse me, we can actually use them for trading products. I spoke in the first session and again in, in, in the one last month about different asset classes to trade and the different volatility levels. 
shares being your high level of volatility. You know, for a stock to do 5% in a day, SAB did 10% today. And you're going to say, ah, oh, but there's, there's M&A activity happening. ABN Bev offered 44 pounds for the shares. 100% <clears throat> correct. But the point is it did 10%. When last did we see an index that wasn't either Russian or Greek? When last did we see a non-Russian or Greek index do 10% in a day? 2008. And that happened to be going down, but nonetheless. So we get that extended volatility. Which is why I like trading indices, because they're less volatile. In other words, they move less aggressively. If they're in a trend, that, that move per day for an index will be 1% or 2% at the most, with the occasional outlier. For a stock, 4 or 5 is perfectly easy, with the occasional 10% outlier, as we saw today. And if AB InBev had gone the other way, and decided they weren't going to buy SAB Miller, we would have gone 30 or 40% downwards instead of 10% upwards. So I like trading indices, and ETFs are essentially indices. They essentially issued over different baskets. S&P 500 is an obvious one, but you can go and get, if you look at the local space in South Africa, we've got indices on resource stocks, on the mid caps, financials, industrials, and so it goes on. So if you're bullish industrials, instead of deciding which industrial stock to buy, you buy the basket. You buy the Industrial 25 ETF. It gives you lower volatility. If one of them doesn't do so great, that's fine. You've still got the others in that basket that can do it for you. So the local industry will park, will go to the, the, the global ETF market, <clears throat> and really it's about New York. NYSE, New York Stock Exchange, over 1,200 listed ETFs. Understand in South Africa, we have 450 shares. That is more than twice our entire market. 1.2 billion in assets. That's dollars. So in rands, that's 15 trillion rand, which makes it bigger than our JSE. So the ETF market in New York is bigger than the JSE. And we're not even looking at the ETF market in Asia or, or Latin America or, or, or Europe or anywhere else. This is just New York listed. Largest in the world is uh, SPDR, which is what we call Spider, tracks the S&P 500, and it alone is $135 billion of assets, which is approximately what SAB Miller is worth at £44 a share. It is humongously massive. A couple of important points, distinction. In South Africa, an ETF physically holds the shares. They have to, by the rules of, of, of the ETF. In other words, that basket, let's take the Satrix 40 with the 40 biggest stocks. They have those 40 stocks in the basket. If Satrix goes bust, you've got those stocks. You protection in that space. In the US, that is not the case. Now, what many companies will do, for example, BlackRocks and Vanguards, and we'll touch on them in a moment, is they do hold the shares. Because what's the best way to give a person a return? Well, hold the shares. If the index is up 10%, and I now owe you 10% because you want to sell, the best way to have generated that 10% was literally to hold the shares. So most of them do physically hold the shares. Where we see places where they don't always is when we start to get exotic ones. And that will be, for example, an ETF issued over China. Over China. It's just very difficult to transact in Shanghai. So what you do is you create derivative structures around it. We also get what we call doubles and geards and shorts. So a double would be two times index. So if the index did 10%, your ETF does 20. Or you get short ones. So if the index falls 10%, your ETF goes up 10%. The problem with those is that they are using derivative products to try and give that performance. So you have two problems, and they broadly come into the same point. The performance doesn't always match the, the, what the expected performance. And when I say it doesn't always match, don't for a moment think that sometimes it exceeds the expected performance. When it doesn't match, it 100% of the time underperforms. The example being the Chinese market when it was on a tear, it went up 100%. But the ETF issued over the Chinese market went up only 64%. Now, I mean, okay, only 64. But what happens if the Chinese market had only gone up 1% and then you went up 0.64? And that's because of the derivative products. And that's because they do something called mark to market. 
which is a function of derivatives. And what that means is they basically freeze the price tonight. And tomorrow when they reopen, they pretend there was no move. So if there's a 2% gain overnight, you know the market closes tonight, tomorrow it opens 2% higher? The ETF would open it exactly where it closed. So it misses the overnight moves. And if you've ever looked at overnight moves, any market in the world, they can be important. And because of the nature of a bull market and because markets by their nature are bullish, what we tend to see is that overnight moves are more often than not positive than negative. Hence, when they're underperforming, they're typically underperforming rather than overperforming their benchmarks. So there are a lot of exotic. I have yet been... I can't yet find a, a, um, a, a, a sector or an industry or something that there isn't an ETF on. So the easy ones are like healthcare. Um, there's one for healthcare aimed at over 70s. They call it senior healthcare. There is the, obviously property ones. There's biotech. Um, so then I thought I'd get clever and I went to look for a Sharia compliant. Yeah, easy. Um, so then I went and looked for the marijuana ETF. Yeah, it exists. There's a marijuana ETF. Ironically, because of the law in America has only recently changed, the marijuana ETF is mostly focused on uh, companies that do enforcement. In other words, they text for the presence of marijuana and arrest you, which is deeply weird because they're no longer, they, they're basically legalizing it. And what's going to happen, I suppose, the growers in California will start listing on, on New York and the like. Um, but I, 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 I haven't yet, you know, I've got a friend, me and Keith, when we, we drink whiskey and you're like, oh, what about this? What about that? Um, there's a green one, of course. There's an inverse green one, which basically says for the, the naysayers who say that uh, global warming is a myth, well, then you can go short green energy, um, whatever you want. Uh, there is a, a, um, a, a, a social media one. There's absolutely everything you could possibly want. There's even a Russian one, yep, um, and a, a, a Greek one too. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, a Greek bond one, and then there's a Greek inverse bond one. So if you thought Greece was going to default, you bought this, and if Greek defaulted, you made money. There is a, um, and what do they call it? Basically, it's like the kids' party one. So what do you have at kids' parties? Sweets, blow-up balloons, fizzy drinks. So this ETF has got stocks that exist in those spaces. I mean, it's almost become like a game for America. You know, it's like we've got 1,200. Well, what haven't we got? Well, we haven't got. There's dig and dug. Dig goes, dig goes up when oil goes up. Dug goes up when oil goes down. That sort of thing. So there is absolutely everything. So in truth, we're overly spoiled for choice. And so what do we do typically when we're overly spoiled for choice? We act like a seven-year-old. No, let me even say we act like a seven-year-old. I act like a seven-year-old. I won't presuppose anything on you. I act like a seven-year-old, and I go into the crazy corners and find the crazy stuff. And that's just the wrong move. The fact that there are 1,200 doesn't mean we need to go and find all 1,200. We just need to say, well, what's the sort of broad strokes that we're interested in? I like healthcare as a concept, but I don't want an individual healthcare stock because I worry about around issues around legislation. I worry around issues of you find the next super drug. It depends what that super drug is. You know, if the next super drug you find is a lifestyle drug, you'll make money from it. If the super drug cures cancer, you're out of business because governments around the world are going to do exactly what they did to the HIV, the ARVs, and they're going to say, you can't make healthcare expensive. So ARVs used to cost 25,000 rand per person per month. Now it costs a buck 82. Same drugs. So I want the basket. Uh, I like India, so I want to go and find one in India as well. Yeah, so, but I'm not being overly niche. I'm not touching biotech because I'm not even sure what biotech is really. Um, I'm not buying the green one because as much as I'm not a, a, a global warming denialist, the problem with cutting edge is that often it cuts itself. And so what you find is first movers often fail. Second and third movers do better. Why? Because they can see the mistakes that the first mover made. So you come at it smarter. And also, when the first mover fails and the business goes into liquidation, you can buy their assets cheaper. And I'm not being facetious. That's part of that process. So as much as I like green, I just think it's too early for it at this point in the process. You can even buy utility companies. When I buy utility companies, I mean a power station. 
I know for South Africans, ESCOM, that seems like the craziest thing in the world. But in America, it just earns you 3.5% per year, no questions asked, because the price increases are legislated. Demand is pretty inelastic. Easy money. Small money, but easy money. So the biggest issue is BlackRock, who we correctly call iShares, own about a third of the market. Vanguard, next in line, who are owning about 16% of the ETF market. There are over 100 ETF issuers. Many of them are, are issuing only a couple at, at the extremes. A lot of them go for the very exotic type of scenarios. The other trick with the very exotics is that often you will find that the expenses within those ETFs are very high. Partly because they can, because you've got no trace. There's only, you know, if there's only one ETF and you want to be in that space, you either pay the fee or you walk away. But also because if they're using derivative products and the like, they often incur higher costs and the like. <clears throat> Importantly, again, always focus on that underlying index. Never chart an ETF. Never go and look at a chart of an ETF. The more liquid ones you can, but the question is why. Go look at those underlyings. And as I said, everything, the social media is the biotechs. So the social media is SOCL, but it's weird what they've put in there, which is why it's important when you buy an ETF is interrogate what you get. In other words, go to BlackRock, which is iShares.com is the website. Go there. And the problem is you type in healthcare and there will be there. BlackRock has five healthcare ETFs. But interrogate. Go look at what those stocks are. Go look at how many stocks there are. For example, in social media is the obvious ones, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Tencent. But then there's also Groupon, which is not, I don't think, social media, and to my mind, going bust. Um, there is also um, uh, Pandora, which is online radio in America. Again, I don't think it's social media, and I think they're having a tough time. It's also uh, the guys who made Candy Crush who are going bust because they made one game and they can't make a second hit. So social media on the surface sounds great until you start to delve into it and you start to think, hmm, not so sure if this is as great as it perhaps sounds. So it's critically important that we go and stick. First, stick with the names. You know, there are a lot of, if, if I see an ETF and I don't recognize who the issuer is, I'm more than comfortable to walk away. I, I'm, I learned a new word this year, and I'm big on it, FOMO, fear of missing out. I do not suffer FOMO. I will walk away from an ETF. If I don't know who that issuer is, then I'm not interested. And in truth, I only trade two, uh, uh, iShares and Vanguard. And, and in truth, in Vanguard, there's only one that really interests me, and that's the S&P 500. Otherwise, iShares has got everything I want. I like their website. I've got used to their website. I can work it. So... Stick with the names and also stick with larger. So, for example, there are two health, healthcare ETFs from Vanguard. And when I, sorry, from iShares, BlackRock. And when I look at them, they, 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 they're almost exactly the same. But one's got assets of 200 million and one's got assets of 4 billion. I buy the 4 billion. No, because at least, you know, why? Does size matter in an ETF? No. But what it means is that a lot of other people have looked at the two and they're probably smarter than me, and they've liked that one, well, then I'll like that one too. Now, there's comfort in the crowd sometimes. Now, sometimes the new one, the other one might be more recently issued, and there might be reasons for it. But I'm typically, a $200 million ETF in America is tiny. It's chicken feed. And, and, and there's every chance, particularly if you're with a second-tier issuer, that they will actually just close it down in time. And then, of course, look at the costs. Same costs we get in South Africa, we call them the TUR, the total expense ratio. That is the internal costs of running that ETF. They will typically deduct those costs from the dividends that you are paid. And in America, total expense ratios are mind-numbingly small in most cases. So the Vanguard S&P 500 has a total expense ratio of 0.05%. And their target is to get it to 0.04. Winced upon, they say quite clearly, and then our target becomes 0 0.03. 0 0.05 in my life is a rounding error. I mean, really, five points? In South Africa, our cheapest ETF is about 20, 0 0.24, which is BBET40. We've got ETFs that are sitting up at 0 0.85. 
So 0 0.05 is, is statistically relevant. But again, if you're looking at two, and, and they're both healthcare, and they've broadly got the same companies in them, and the same assets within, and same sort of size, then look at the cost and say, which is different? You will find some of the more exotics, as I said, will, be, will have higher total expense ratios. In the States, a high totally, I mean, a massively high totally expense ratio in the States is probably 0 0.6, maybe 0 0.7. But ultimately, that's money that's been taken out of your future and given to somebody else so that they can create wealth. So to my mind, it's always the case of the costs are always going to be critically important. But my, my process of flow is first stick with the names, BlackRock, iShares, and Vanguard. Second, Within that space, I prefer larger over smaller. And sometimes there's issues. What I also prefer, for example, um, in the one that tracks uh, India, there's one that tracks the Indian index, which is called the Nifty 50. Excuse me, but the Indian stock market is a weird place. Um, they've got the, the companies that we know kind of, like Tata and the like, but then they've got companies like uh, uh, Reliance, which is a marketing company. It's like the fourth biggest listed company in India. And I can't get my head around how you make that much money from marketing. Uh, I know there are a billion people, but, but I don't understand how that works. Um, and just the index was overweight into, into, into sectors that I just can't get excited about, such as marketing, um, such as, 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 as uh, uh, the other big one they're in is, is communication. And when they say communication, they're, they're not talking mobile communication. They again, kind of talking marketing and PR messaging, and I don't get that. So in that case, I prefer the other one, which is the MSCI index, because it's much broader. So we've still got the marketing guys, but they're a tiny percentage of it. So if you see things that look weird, we'll carry on hunting. Now, Ashes has three ETFs issued over India. So you can pick and choose. There's the classic Nifty, uh, Nifty 50, which is their equivalent of the top 40. There's the MCSR, which is Morgan Stanley, who do the indices, and then they do an ETF over it, which is, again, it's got 40 stocks, but what they've done is basically changed the weightings of the stocks. Uh, and then there's a third one, and I can't remember what the nuances were about the third one. I think it, it was another, it was, again, it was iShares, but they had a, th a third one in that space as well. And if you're struggling to differentiate, don't sweat it. Is one of them going to do better than the other? Yes. Which one? Probably the one you don't buy. <laughs> That's just Murphy. The point is, don't sweat it. You know, you know what we do? We get so stressed out by, oh, how do I, and we spend months and days, and we draw formulas and make spreadsheets and, to decide which is the best, and at the end of the day, just buy one and go and have a life somewhere. You know, drink wine, go surfing. You can spend forever choosing between two ETS, but I think there's better things to do with our lives. You know, narrow it down, do a bit of homework. Once you spend kind of 15 minutes, it's time to make a decision. And if you can't make a decision, walk away. Costs, as I said, the exotics. I mean, I just stay away from the exotics. I, I the doubles, the shorts, the crazy ones, to me, I, I just, I, I don't need them. You know, they're there. It's like gold mining companies, eh? I mean, they're there. But I don't ever want to own a gold mining company. So I leave them. They exist on the JFC. I see them going up and down. I've got a friend who tells me how much money he's losing when he trades them. I don't worry about them. Same here. Huh? Fear of missing out. i got no firm on me. I just move on. So the beauty with these ETFs is then, of course, we've got the ETF, and we can put that in a long-term portfolio, and we can hold it. And I always say that any investment portfolio should be a minimum 50% ETFs, um, and as you and, and and push that number higher, so at least 50%, and you can push it to you can push it to 100%. For most people stuck in the traffic of Santon this evening, their allocation should be 100% ETFs. You're here this evening, we're, the more advanced we are, those 2% those is up at the top of the range. I would still say at least 50% in ETFs. We can, of course, trade them. And when we trade them, we can trade them as ETFs. So, in other words, ungeared. So, you think that uh, America is going to be a grand performer for the next whatever. You get a buy signal on the S&P 500. You can go buy the ETF. And as it boogies along, you make money from it. Um, 
you can, of course, leverage them. So you can buy a CFD on it. So if you want, you can take them and trade them over much shorter time frames. What you find, again, as I mentioned up front, you're in an ETF, you're going to find less volatility. So it will be less of a scary ride. But again, as I always say, be very careful about overgearing your entire portfolio. Yeah, Alex, if you've got, and I'm going to use 100,000 as a random number, if you've got 100,000 Rand sitting in a trading account, at most you want 300, maybe, maybe 350,000 Rand exposure. The fact that your provider might offer you 700 or even a million doesn't mean you should take it. And what that means is that you don't need to put every last cent you have into margin. So you keep some back. Why? It reduces the overall uh, exposure in your portfolio. And secondly, it gives you a bit of a buffer for, for margin calls, for variation margin. Because if you've taken your 100,000 and turned it into 700,000 or a million, one little blink against you, you know, Janet Yellen stubs her toe tonight, and tomorrow morning you're game over. So always keep that buffer. Typically, I would say use about maximum half of your cash in margin. The other half, you just leave in cash. Deeply boring, but you'll stay alive for longer. <clears throat> American deposit receipts. The other thing with trading in the U.S., is aside from the fact that they've got eight or 10,000 or 6,000 shares listed in America. I was talking earlier about the Russell 2000. That's their mid-cap index. It has 2,000 shares in it. Our mid-cap index has 60. They've got 2,000 shares in their mid-cap. Um, their small-cap index is 3,000, I think, and then they've got, so they've got the Russell 2000, the Russell 3000. But it's not just American companies. Notwithstanding, there are a lot of American companies, a vast number we have never heard of, many that we have, the big ones, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples, um, the Teslas, the Netflix. But th there are a bunch of small regional little companies. You know, there, there's one, I was listening to a podcast earlier in the week, they basically make nuts and bolts in, 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 north, in uh, uh, upper New York State. And they listed on the, on the New York Stock Exchange. They got a market capitalization of about 150 million US dollars, and they plot along and they make money and they've got shareholders. They've currently got uppity shareholders, that's how I heard about them, but nonetheless. But what we get is this funky thing called American deposit receipts. So you want to trade Samsung. <clears throat> Samsung is listed in South Korea. Best of luck trading in South Korea. So what do you do? You trade the Samsung ADR in New York. ADR, American Deposit Receipt Negotiable Certificate issued by an American bank representing a specific number of shares or single share in a foreign stock. So there are 67 companies uh, covered, and these are companies that are not New York listed. For example, Sassel. So Sassel is South African listed. You can buy it in South Africa. You can also buy the Sassel ADR in New York. How does an ADR work? So it is literally a guarantee. So these are issued by third-party banks. Most of them are large banks we know, Bank of America, JP Morgan, etc. They say, okay, cool. So we'll sell you this ADR. This ADR entitles you to one Sassel share. You get the dividends, but you cannot attend the annual general meeting. No annual general meeting. But you do get the dividends. Importantly, what they don't do is they don't do a market maker. So what should happen is say a Sassel's trading at 400 Rand in South Africa and the exchange rate is 12, it should be trading at, okay, can I change my numbers to easy? Let's say Sassel's trading at 480 Rand in South Africa and the exchange rate is 12, that equals $40. So the Sassel ADR should be $40 on New York. But because there's no market maker, it might go to 42, it might go to 37. As the currency is moving, obviously it's changing. If the currency suddenly went from 12 to 10, it would go from 40 to 48. So it's not a, there should be a direct linear relationship, and there is over time, but you often see what you call arbitrage, and there are people out there who arbitrage. So if there's a difference in price, what do you do? You buy one side, you sell the other side, you're net flat, and you basically lock in the profit. Now, that requires, I mean, that, that's, the profits are so small, it typically doesn't work for us, and we can't get the efficiencies of the exchange rates. 
And sometimes what they do is it's not one share. It might be an ADR is equal to two SASL. Or, for example, one ADR in, in New York is equal to half a bulletin, but a London bulletin, not a Joburg or Sydney bulletin. Yeah, I, I don't know why either, but that's how it is. But what ADRs then do for you is they still give you the currency exposure. They still give you the economic and all the other risk that you have within the share, within the country. If Sassel's share price collapses because Sassel Berg blows up tonight, then, then Sassel share will, ADR will collapse in New York tomorrow. And if Sassel goes sideways for a year, the ADR will move as the currency moves. But what it suddenly means is it opens up a, a second universe in a sense. I mean, notwithstanding that New York is big enough. I mean, to my mind, 1,200 ETFs is about 1,000 too many. To then add six or seven or 8,000 shares on top, it starts to hurt my head. And then we start to add the ADRs. And, and, and I mean, the obvious ones, I mean, there's a bunch of them. Obviously, Samsung, Tencent, which we as Africans know very well, um, is Hong Kong listed. It's not easy to trade Hong Kong, but there's an ADR that we can get. Um, Prime Biomed is an Austrian company. I put it up there because it's, it's supposedly in the, in the buyer space the best. Um, Nomura is a Japanese company. Now, in many cases, we might be able to trade on the Nikkei, but there's also a particular point why you want to stick with trading in one currency, and I'll come to that in a second. The important point is, so these are, they're basically financial services firm, but they're considered to be sort of the boffins in terms of research and the like, whereas uh, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs are supposed to be the boffins in terms of profit. These guys are boffins in terms of research, which is weird. Their research doesn't always make them money, but the research is always well thought out. Um, and you'll often hear them quoted, Bruce Woodfield and a couple of other the local stations interview them quite often. So suddenly, almost any large company that we're interested in, if it's of decent size, it's trading in New York. And if you look at South African companies that have ADRs, just to give you an example, obviously there's the top tier companies, right? Um, there's Sassel, there's, there's BHP Bulletin and, and SAB Miller and all of those. Nice, nice, nice. But there's a lot of second tier companies as well. Pioneer, Clover, Mix Telematics is three. And none of those stand out to you as like a giant of a company. No disrespect to any of those companies. None of them stand out to you as a giant. But they have an ADR. For a very simple reason, that ADRs cost very little to do and to administer. So you list it, you issue it. There's no listing fees because it's an ADR. It's out and it's there. So it's not just that you can go and trade Samsung, which is you know, probably one of the best named brands coming out of South Korea, but you can probably find second tier Korean companies, Austrian companies, Japanese companies, etc. Whether you want to go there or not, your call. I find second tier South Africa challenging enough. I don't need second tier South Korean. But it does, in every sense of the word, just explode that world open. It's your... 8,000 stocks in New York, it is your 1,200 plus ETFs, and it is a couple of thousand ADRs. Important point in ADR, as I said, you don't get to vote at the AGM, uh, you do get the dividends, and it is a legal obligation. That company who's issued the ADR does it via an SPV, special purpose vehicle. If that issuing bank goes bankrupt, your shares which they hold exist somewhere else. They can't sell shares into the market, ADRs, that they don't physically hold the shares for. So when they wanted to issue, to sell Clover ADRs, firstly, they need to get a basket of Clover shares. And they get a basket of 200 Clover shares, they can sell 200 ADRs. When they've sold that 200, they need to go get more Clover shares. Of course, with companies like Sassel, there's a huge amount of secondary trade. In other words, I'm selling my Sassel ADR to you. And you're selling it to you and selling it to you rather than selling it back to the, to the, to the initial person all the time. So then to the real crux of going offshore. And that is quite simply that we then move into other currencies. Now, there's a couple of views. You know, why do we take money offshore? Mm. Because the rand will weaken. Yeah, fair enough. And the rand will weaken simply because against the major country, cu currencies out there, and let's take US, Western Europe, uh, uh, UK, and the like. 
we have a higher interest rate than they do, and we should weaken every year by the differential in that interest rate. So if the American interest rate, sorry, not interest rate inflation, if American inflation is 1% and our inflation is 5%, the RAND should weaken by 4% against the US dollar every single year. And that's never happened in the history of humankind, but that's the theory behind it. That's why currencies broadly weaken. In truth, we get a lot more volatility because of traders and, and inflows of money. In truth, what drives the currency? Money coming into the country will see the rand stronger. Money leaving the country will see the rand weaker. That's why when we had a crisis like in 2008, what happens? Our currency gets killed. Our currency gets killed this year again because of crisis. It wasn't our crisis. Well, it is peripherally in its mining. But the worry is in China. So what happens? Everyone takes their money home. And you, you, know, you were invested in Johannesburg. And you're like, nah, forget that. You sell your shares. You take your money back to America. Weakens the currency. To my mind, it's all mute. I live in rands. I earn rands. I spend in rands. Rands is what matters to me. The reason I go offshore is not to protect my rands. Um, because I can do that locally. I go offshore to buy assets that I can't buy in Johannesburg. Our market, uh, we, we might be the 12th biggest exchange in the world, but that gap between the first tier and the second tier is humongous. You know, we've got an ETF market bigger than the JSC, and that's just the ETF market. Um, you know, Apple's going to be a trillion rand company one day. Apple will be bigger than the JSC when it hits a trillion dollars. And that's just mind-boggling, but it's what it is. The point being is that when we're going overseas, we obviously trading in foreign currencies. We need to manage that. Pro excuse me, we need to manage that process. So a couple of points. Within the IG environment, your local account is obviously rand based and can only be rand based. That is a South African Reserve Bank requirement. You 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 are allowed to have foreign currency bank accounts, but they have to be offshore. So you can go to your bank and say, please open me a bank account in whatever territory you want, in whatever currency you want. But you can't have a South African bank account with non-RANDs in it. It has to be RANDs. At some point in our life, exchange controls will disappear. At this moment, they're not there. You then open an international account. When you open a local one, you get an international account at the same time. That default currency is going to be sterling. So when you deposit RANDs into it, they will be converted into Sterling, pounds. Important point quickly, your first million rand that you take offshore every year, no questions asked. You can then, and that's per individual. You can then take another 10 million rand per individual per year, but you need clearance from SARS. And that clearance is very easy. As long as your tax affairs are up to date, you get the certificate in about 48 hours. If your tax affairs are not up to date, well, you and SARS are going to have some nasty conversation actually. So, I mean, you know, the, the exchange control regulations in terms of limits don't really impact the average human being every day. I mean, not many of us are trying to move more than 11 million rand a year offshore. So your base account is sterling as your default. You can select different defaults, euros, USD, uh, sterling, Swiss franc, etc. My advice is make your base account US, US dollars. And I'll tell you how and I'll tell you why, but most important why. It's because most of what you're buying and selling is going to be U.S. It's going to be New York. And in fact, you can take it a step further. And it's what I've done in my offshore account. I only transact in U.S. dollars for two reasons. One, because everything I've ever wanted to buy, I could buy in U.S. dollars. And two, because if I've got a U.S. dollar account and I go buy something in sterling, there's a currency conversion and therefore there is a fee. In the case of IG, the fee is 0.3%. So if your base account is sterling and you go and buy a New York listed uh, 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 security in dollars, when you bring the money back from dollars back to sterling, you get charged 0.3%. 0.3% is tiny. 0.3% every single time you transact can become less tiny. Even if you're not a regular, even if you're just in, you know, I'm one of those folks. I'm from Durban. So maybe it's the Durban, it's the sea air in me. But if I can save 25 cents, man, I will save it. And I actually don't know what I would do with 25 cents. So I can, I'm trying to think, what's the chappy cost these days? I don't chew gum. But the point is, it's 0.3%. Put it in your pocket. 
So to my mind, everything you want to buy, you can buy in USD in, in New York. So have your base currency in New York. But here's the first, the, the, the bigger trick perhaps. When you open the account, the default will be sterling. Do not deposit money. <coughs> Phone IG, say, please convert my base currency to US dollar. Then deposit money. Because if you deposit money into sterling, then you convert to US dollar, 0.3%. So open the account, contact the call center, tell them you would like your base currency to be converted to US dollars, no problem. When that's confirmed to be done, then deposit your US dollars. Or you deposit rands, they convert to US dollars. Of course, the trading, and, and then what do we typically do? Is we keep on looking at the exchange rate. Forget the exchange rate. You know, the, the, so you bought a share and the exchange rate was 14 and now it's 12 and you've actually lost 14. Per Forget that. Focus on the dollars. Forget the conversion back to rands. Yes, you may bring it back one day, but worry about the currency rates when you bring it back. Don't stress it. If you base currency US dollar and you go trade in euros, for example, you've now got two things happening. You've obviously got the price of the security you bought in euros, but you've got the euro dollar exchange rate as well. So if you did the, if you entered the trade when it was 110 and you exited it at 115, there's that move too, which again is why apart from, so that to me is just too many moving parts. I go back to USD is my base currency and I only trade stuff that trades in USD. And I haven't yet found anything I can't trade in USD. Uh, to the point, there is a the Hellenic bottling company, Greek company, they make Coca-Cola for Western Europe. Um, the fact that Greece is bankrupt is neither here nor there. Europeans continue to drink Coca-Cola. And I wanted to buy the Hellenic bottling company, which is listed on the Athens Stock Exchange. And of course, has an ADR in New York. So I buy it in New York. I'm not going to fill in Athens uh, hard work. Nothing that you want, you can't get in your USDs. So then I, I touched on this right up front. I said I was going to come back to it. Trade or invest. I'm going to come to the both in a moment. Let's first define what we mean by trade and what we mean by invest. So trade is typically going to be transactions that are less than three years and many times will include geared or derivatives, CFDs, whatever the case may be. Why three years? So if you go to sars.gov.za and search for shareholders handbook, there is a PDF which basically talks about, and there is version three of that PDF came out in February of this year. First version came out in 2008 or nine. And SARS quite simply in very unambiguous language says, if you buy something and sell it within three years, we are going to assume that that is for income. If you buy something and sell it after three years, we will assume it is for capital gain and we will tax you differently. If you trade any derivative, SARS will say you're a trader, but you can trade equities with shorter time horizons. I do. The key point, trade them in different accounts. If you've got a long-term investment account and a short-term trading account, keep them separate because the biggest issue with SARS is intent. So you bought a share for your long-term buy and hold portfolio, and three days later, something happened and you didn't want it and you sold it. And so I says, trading. And you can say, well, no, actually, I bought it for that and this happened. And look, proof is that I bought it in my investing account. And that's happened to me and so I will let you off. Unless you do it every day, in which case they're going to realize what you're doing. So typically, it's going to be durations of less than three years. Typically, it will be geared, although not always geared. I mean, uh, 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 derivatives and the like, and typically you're focusing on charts rather than fundamentals. Some folks will do a blend of, some people will either even trade on fundamentals, but broadly a trader is looking at charts and trading geared instruments. Whereas an investor is looking at longer than three years, typically ungeared, typically fundamentals. And you can actually have multiple strategies. So I've got my long-term what I call till death to us part portfolio, where I hold my outstanding companies I hope to own forever until I die or they die, whichever happens first. Um, and then I have a few of my second tier sort of penny stocks, small caps type of scenarios. And when I say a few, I have two in that portfolio. Then I've got a giant portfolio of ETFs. 
And then I have two trading methodologies. I have a momentum and a lazy trading methodology. Um, my momentum, I do both top 40 and mid cap. And my lazy, I do local. And from next year, we'll be doing international as well. So one, two, three, seven different portfolios. Three of them fitting into investing. Four of them fitting into trading. Only one of them actually using gearing. So different methodologies, and you can have multiple methodologies across. Tax is important. So I'm going to preface this by saying I am not a tax expert. You should get tax advice from an accountant or a friendly SARS person. And no, they really are friendly. I mean, they're the one state department who really realize that you pay their salary. Um, you're not going to get more help anywhere else apart from SARS. Um, so here's the simple version. As a trader, SARS has deemed that you are doing this for income, and therefore you are taxed at your marginal tax rate. You can, however, deduct costs. For example, if this was a paid presentation, you could deduct that cost. If you subscribe to Finweek, you can deduct the cost of that. If you subscribe to DSTV to only watch Channel 412, and you can somehow prove that you only watch Channel 412. And that's really easy. The way the Sharks are playing these days, there's no other Channel 2 watch. If you could prove that you only watch 412, you could claim your DSTV and your TV and I don't know. I couldn't prove it. You can absolutely claim the cost of your account. So you've got an admin fee. You can claim it. Your brokerage fees. You can claim it. The interest you charged on your CFDs. Claim it. You're losing trades. You claim them. Basically, you've got income, which is winning trades, less all costs. You, you trade from home and you've got a DSO line. You can prorate to claim that. Careful of claiming office space. That has implications when you sell your house. Remember, your house primary asset exempt from CGT. But if you claim 10% of your house was for income purposes, when you sell it, that 10% is not exempt from CGT. But any cost. So I've got a friend in Durban called Hagar. That's actually not his name. Um, but I met him on a chat forum, and I know him as Hagar. And me and Hagar get together occasionally and drink. I mean, just, I mean, we just drink. Like vast quantities, and then occasionally we will eat. The point is, is that me and Hagar met on a chat forum talking about shares. Me and Hagar meet, and we talk about shares. I discovered when I met him last time, it's not that he's married. I thought he was married. The, the wedding ring gave it away. It said he got a 21-year-old kid. I've known this guy 13 years. I didn't know he had a 21-year-old kid. Why? Because we talk shares, market, stocks. So I take that slip from the drinking bout, and I put it as an expense because we were talking markets. And did we learn anything? To be honest, can't remember. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, don't, don't cheat. I mean, you can certainly occasionally – I'm not even going to say that. Don't cheat. <laughs> Just some don't cheat. But you paid your marginal rate less costs. If you are investing, longer than three years, you pay capital gains tax on profit when you sell. So what they do is they take the price you paid, they move it to what the exit price was, you made a profit. If you've got many purchases that you've done over the period, um, they will typically they will say, right, take an average of it. If you bought a share before 1 October 2001, anyone? Ah, I'll tell you anyway. If you bought it before 1 October 2001, you pay the price on 1 October 2001 because that's the date that capital gains tax was introduced. Before then, we never had CGT. When you make a profit, your first 30000 per year of capital gains is tax-free, not per share. So if you make 30000 trading shares, but you also, I don't know, traded an exotic car and made 30000 there, then you've got capital gains of 60000 They give you the first 30000 free. And capital gains is one-third of your marginal rate, but no cost deductions. So you can't take your Finry subscription or your Channel 412 subscription or your beers with Hagar and claim those back. It really is capital gains. But ultimately, it's 41% versus 13.3. This 41% hurts. I know, it's a byproduct of success. No profit, no tax. 
but you have a great year, you pay SARS, and you basically seem to have worked for SARS. Just saying. So in closing, I don't know, there was a time, and I'm, I, I can't actually remember why, there was a, I remember lots of debates in the sort of early 2000s and the like, should we be investing offshore? And in truth, it's a silly debate. And it's not a debate about, about South Africa is broken and the Rand is going to, 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 to wherever. I, I don't subscribe to either of those. It's a debate about choice. It's range of choice. And to me, that's why we go offshore. Our market is tiny. You know, we're getting our first storage company listing at the end of the month. Now, we, could, we should probably be very afraid. But the point is that New York has six storage companies listed already. And we're getting our first one. When you go to invest in property in America, it's not a case of, well, do you want offshore local resident? You know, they've got residential. They've got health property. In other words, the companies that own the, the hospitals, the actual physical buildings. That's all they have. They entire companies and ETFs that just own the buildings of the hospitals. They don't do the surgery. They just charge rent every, every month and that sort of thing. So it's that range. That's why we go. To me, it's New York Stock Exchange just because there's nothing I've ever wanted to buy that I couldn't find there. You've got your ETFs. You've got your ADRs. And as I said, make your base currency U.S. And do that before you put money in. And then stick to it. And if you ever find something that you really feel you need to have to buy and you can't find it on New York, let me know. Not because I can help, but because I have at least one example of what you can't buy in New York. I come right back to this is what we started. And I'm, as I said, I'm going to go into, into a lot more detail. But I suppose in a sense almost, some homework for the, the month ahead until we're back in November is analyze your trades and look at, don't, don't look at your entries and exits so much as, you know, almost put them in an Excel spreadsheet and sort them by profit and loss. And see if you can't make the losers a little tighter and the winners a little larger. Not by a lot necessarily. I suppose start interrogating, uh, firstly, are you efficient at stop loss? Do you obey stop loss? I mean, to my mind, particularly if you're in equity, stop loss is easy, right? You open the trade, you p get a guaranteed stop loss. It's going to cost you some money but get a guaranteed stop loss, walk away. It, it removes all of that risk out of the equation. And then focus on the selling at profit. And that is hard. That is hard. I'm the man who sold SAB at 85 Rand. Rand. And that was a, uh, there was a six-bagger when I sold it. And since then, it's been another 10-bagger. So we're going to go into that in a lot more detail going forward. I come to this one every time. Because these are the important, what are we trading? What assets, what derivatives? Why? Why are we not, well, why are we trading? And don't tell me because you want to be rich. Yeah, find me a person who wants to be poor. Why? Why are you trading the, the SA40 instead of NASPAS? And I'm not saying one's better than the other, but no why. Have those reasons there. Um, what about the volatility? How do you trade? What time frames? Why are you trading a five-minute chart and not a 15? Why are you trading at intraday instead of an end of day? And, and what's critically important, there's no right or wrong. This is not about right or wrong. This is not about you bringing this back next week and I'm mark you and I'll laugh at you. Ha-ha! <laughs> One-minute chart, silly man. No, 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 no. This is about always interrogating what we do, why we do it, how we do it, to make sure that, that, that we know the reasons that we're comfortable with the reasons, that we're confident in what we're doing and our ability to do it. And this, I mean, this is an exercise I do every year over my Christmas holidays. I take giant Christmas holidays, four or five weeks if I possibly can. And I spend as much time as possible on a surfboard. And this is what occupies my brain. The what's, the why's, the where's, the how's. And most years I make no changes because I, I hate changing systems that work. But I go that process anyway. The things that we always need to consider and bring in, we've touched on some, we're going to be, ultimately we'll go through all of them, emotions, risks, we're coming to that one shortly, strategies, discipline, we've touched on, critically important, exposure we've touched on, and knowledge, obviously, the process. Never be scared to ask the questions, whether it's Twitter, whether it's me, whether it's the call center, never be scared to ask the questions. No stupid questions, only stupid answers. We're back 10 November. 
We're looking at, uh, in essence, share events. So LDTs, dividends, book builds, IPOs, suspended shares, rights issues, and how we trade them, how we manage them, the impact they have on the shares, on the prices, but also the impact they have if you're geared and the like. So this is the really nitty gritty. And then we're back again to December and then again next year. No, so it's really simple. I mean, there are websites like etfdb.com, which is etfdatabase.com. Do not sign up for their newsletter. They will spam you to death. It took, it took, it took special powers to stop them trying to spam me. Um, but I don't use them. So I just go to iShares.com. And what you do is you say, you type in, you go and you find health and it lists a couple and you literally go in. And what they do is they give you the fact sheets and the fact sheets will tell you what they held at the last quarter. It tells you not only the stocks that they're holding and the percentage weightings, but it also tells you the methodology, shows you performance, shows you tracking error, excuse me, also shows you sectors. So when you go and look at a S&P 500, the sectors will be financial, industrial, and the like. When you go look at a, at a property one, the sectors will be residential, medical, uh, 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 retail, et cetera, et cetera. And so that information is all available, not via the exchanges, but via the issuer of the ETF. Ladies and gents, I've run my time, so I'm going to park it there. Contact details for IG, contact details for my stuff, legal stuff. If you make money, it's yours. Lose money, no longer yours. <laughs> Uh, as I said, we are back again in 10 November and then all the way to December back. We run all the way through to, to uh, June of next year. The videos will be online at justonelap.com. Uh, give me two days. My software editing is giving me a hard time. Um, and you, as I said, back 10 November. Thanks very much for your time this evening. Yeah.